Gender in Central Asia is the topic of today's talk. Let me introduce myself before we start. My name is Elena Kim. I work at the American University of Central Asia in Kyrgyzstan, as well as in Bard College, New York at AUCA. This is how I look today. It's a very fresh photo. I have a PhD in International Development Studies. With this background, I work as a professor of social sciences at the American University of Central Asia, doing research on the issues of gender violence, gender development, ethnography, and Central Asia, and teach. I teach courses related to gender international development, politics of gender in Central Asia, and um, research methodology in the qualitative um, vector. Yeah. So in today's talk, we'll be talking about gender um, perception in Central Asia today, which is the content of the one semester long course. And I'm trying to briefly survey the most pertinent topics related to this large theme. Um, I'd like to inform you that this talk is based on the assumption belief rather that gender is intimately linked with politics and economy as an organizing principle of social life. And in this presentation, I want to show how political and economic regimes transformed gender structure, gender practice, and understanding of gender in the region during the last two centuries when a series of significant developments occurred and had a profound effect on how people of Central Asia live their lives as gendered being. I'm focusing on Russia's imperial reform in the 19th century, the Soviet Union policy of women's emancipation uh, in the early 20th century, and the developments during the late 20th century during the era of post-independence. I am also going to talk a little bit about the pre-colonial gender order, which is the period of time before the Russian uh, conquest of the territory, which we today call the Central Asia. So speaking of this pre-colonial gender order, um, we must understand that the current gender order in Central Asia was shaped by the Russian imperial, colonial, and later Soviet state-centered efforts to remake the existing social and cultural structure in the region. So the gender order in pre-colonial Central Asia was markedly different. Um, and it reflected a different gender structure. So the Central Asian pre-colonial gender structure also reflected categories such as occupation, artistry, ability, skills, age, and beauty. So based on the materials from the 19th century, Turkestan, uh, Fergana Wally, populated ma mainly by settled communities, a pre-colonial gender structure was non-dichotomous, which means it not only included females and males, but also included other categories. For example, a bacha or a young boy dancer. Um, you see on the slide a poster which depicts a bacha of that time. So it is important to know that the gender structure among the nomadic and semi-nomadic population might have been different from the settled communities. But uh, two uh, imperial ethnographers, Nalivkina and Nalivkin, um, their research showed that some of the Turkestan settled communities um, had bacha yes, as, an, as, an, as another category, a young, good-looking boys um, a group, 
uh, would be called bacha, they would often be well skilled in the art of uh, dancing and performing, and they would do their performances and services um, in front of older men at portraits, in private homes or tea houses or at public celebrations. So Nalivkina and Nalivkin argued that by the end of the 19th century, growing female sex work facilitated by the Russian colonial administration replaced the local bacha, while other scholars and travelers observe and demonstrate a growing moral disdain expressed by the colonizers that limited this gender category of bacha to the fallen man, thus reducing their complex gender identity to only sexuality. These examples demonstrate that the bacha's social position, their complex gender identity, and the social reception of bacha by the larger local community differed significantly from the bacha's depiction and treatment as an amoral and pathologic, pathological uh, group of people by the late colonial and early communist and Soviet administration and the government. Therefore, Bacha exemplifies how gender identities were erased through the efforts to quote unquote, civilize and change the local social structure by the imperial and later Soviet regimes. Now, with this slide, I'd like to mention that there is literature that suggests um, powerful figures of women in pre-colonial Central Asia, whose polit political and economic influence was profound, yet less known. For example, Timurid women of the ruling class patronized architecture with their own private funds. And one of the most audacious of these women um, patrons was Queen Gauhar Shah, uh, who was the wife and consort of the Timurid uh, uh, ruler Shahrukh. His, and she spent a decade as a de facto ruler of the Timurid Empire after arranging the coronation of her young grandson upon her husband's death. Not only she broke the custom that prevented women from patronizing mosques, she built two of them and um, trans, you know, transformed them from places of worship to public spaces where political decisions were made. Second uh, depiction is Berthe, who was one of the wives of Chinggis Khan and whose role in managing the um, organization of the nomadic camp of Chinggis Khan was enormous. She was managing numerous um, families, numerous uh, military um, uh, organizations within the nomadic uh, camp of, of Genghis Khan. And of course, the third one is Kumanjan Datka, who was a politician in Kyrgyzstan, um, 19th, yes, late 19th, early 20th century, and her role in bringing stability to the region and her encounters and diplomacy with the Russian um, imperial administration was um, absolutely uh, influential in um, preventing uh, war in the region. Well, this is of course not to say and not to romanticize that period and uh, uh, not to give an impression that pre-colonial gender structure did not practice gender segregation. In fact, men and women often led homosocial activities, which means socializing with the same gender identity. And the homosocial entertainment and visitations were some of the most uh, favorite pastime among women and men of that, of that um, period. Uh, and sensuality, beauty, and beautiful manners, including generosity and kind etiquette, were desirable attributes of all gender at that time. And here on the slide, I'm showing three hivans yeah, and drinking tea in the courtyard of their home. And on the other one is a, the painting of the gatherings of the Timurids. So seclusion practices varied from region uh, to region. 
but uh, the researchers of that time concluded that women's rights and their social positions in the region were much better than those of the European women. However, um, yeah, um, just to add to you know, a couple of sentences to the women's position is that the pre-colonial gender order reflected um, religious uh, sentiments and uh, sensibilities and standards of community such as reciprocity, respect and exchange, which was not equality and not her sexual companionship and was hierarchical, but it was less centralized and dogmatic than in the subsequent gender orders. Um, brought by the, you know, uh, colonial Russian regime and the Central, uh, where Central Asian gender order became progressively state-centered and the state became the main um, arbiter of social organization of gender relations um, in the region. Yes, so here I'm showing you the famous painting by Vasily Fereshagin called The Russian Conquest of Central Asia which happened in the 19th century when the Russian empire became expanded and spread into Central Asia, into the land that later became the Russian Turkestan and even later the Soviet Central Asia. The so imperial legal re reforms um, espoused criticism of the local religious leadership and included the criticism of sanctioning women's oppression through polygyny and seclusion. And these legal reforms which centered on women's position in the Central Asian societies, solidified Russia's rule over the region as a benevolent civilizer in charge of the economy. So the imperial authorities outlawed practices of polygyny, uh, ch uh, child marriages, and increasingly scorned local gender diversity. Um, it reaffirmed ontological differences in which only men and women were fundamental to the gender structure. Um, yes, so, but these effects were are still believed to be not as crucial as the ones that followed in the 20th century, the transformation of Central Asia uh, gender order by the Soviet, um, by the Soviet state. So this slide illustrates the desired transformation from um, of, of, you know, um, a Muslim oppressed Muslim so woman into a Soviet Central Asian woman. All these categories are, of course, um, quoted. So in 1917, Russian revolution and communist leadership afterwards were uh, motivated, yes, to make the Central Asian Muslim women into the citizens of the Soviet Union with all the benefits and restrictions of the new state. So the Soviet Union de-established religion in every way. It closed down mosques, it arrested religious leaders, it forbade Sharia law, which had previously guided family relation um, for the Central Asian Muslims. And the Soviet family law defined marriage differently. It outlawed, again, child marriage. It allowed divorce. And as a result of the communist organizers' disdain towards bourgeoisie values, art and lifestyle, religious sensibilities and standards of local beauty, um, the pr Soviet criteria for gender differentiation were discarded, um, were discarded fully. So same-sex practices were pathologized and criminalized, and Central Asia by child's activities and practices were banned. Sensuality and beautiful manners, including emotion and tenderness, which were desirable attributes of all genders, came to be seen as too feminine. Um, additionally, the Soviet reforms further racialized gender identities, whereby European or rather Slavic appearance and linguistic competence in Russian language increased one's uh, social status and politicized women's rights as markers of national and societal development. So um, beginning from, from 1920s, specifically in 1927, the women's branch of the communist party became Hujum, 
which is a campaign to liberate the Central Asian women through the act of unveiling. So in many countries, particularly Uzbekistan, Muslim women wore heavy veils, which concealed their faces and bodies. But to the Bolsheviks, these veils were an obvious symbol of oppression of women and the backwardness of the Central Asian people. Consequently, the Bolsheviks targeted the veil in order to help the people of Central Asia, quote unquote, realize their full human potential. So here on the, on the photo, I, um, here are the two photos, one showing women, um, Central Asian women sitting at the desk, uh, receiving education, and in the uh, right part of it is the public burning, yes, uh, public unveiling of women where they would remove their veils and burn them. And this one is from the central square of Tashkent. And of course, the, these uh, actions were deemed completely inappropriate by many settled Central Asian communities, and it entailed you know, grave consequences um, for, for them. The forceful ref or the um, the Muslim clergy uh, resisted fierce, fiercely this um, forced refusal, re forced uh, removal of the hijabs. And not all unveilings were voluntary, well, voluntary, of course. And some women were forced to remove the veil at the gunpoint. Um, so women uh, experienced double pressure. On the one hand, there was this communist party that were forcing them to unveil. On the other hand, their own men from their own communities forced them to veil uh, and forced them to re uh, object the, the, the Bolsheviks' uh, pressure. Um, many uh, archival data demonstrates that after this public um, unveiling uh, sessions, yes, women, unveiled women, were raped, brutalized, and even killed as they went back home unveiled. So from early on, women's bodies and women's dress were at the center of this debate, um, the, the, the debate which divided the um, people among them and us, civilized and civilized, uh, you know, Slavic versus the Orient, um, all with the purpose to reinstate specific uh, power relations. So the communist government from Moscow uh, called liberating local women, local women from their dependence and seclusion, right, by their families and husbands. And this necessitated women to leave the premises of their private homes into the public remove their veils and participate in their labor. So these are the two propaganda posters of that time. And now, uh, you know, the first one clearly illustrates, you know, all that. It says, translates as the female laborer of the East, liberate yourself, meaning unveil, join the industry, join the collective farms, join the cohorts of socialism builders. On the right part of the, of the, um, slide here, there's another poster which says that the fully fledged Soviet woman votes for the socialist motherland and for the life full of happiness. And again, so these are the kind of encouragement that women uh, received from the state to join the wage labor, which was necessary for this Soviet state building. This calls, however, educational and cultural campaigns, as well as legal injunctions that followed, did not make women independent agents. It is believed now that um, they were simply reallocated in terms of their dependence from the immediate family to the Soviet state. And this strategic placement of gender at the center of Central Asia's social transformation politicized gender roles and women's rights but did little to change male supremacy uh, with, within family and societal leadership. So here I'm going to show you um, some of the um, 
successes, yes, of the Soviet women's emancipation policy. Yes, so these are the, these are the photos that are taken of the Central Asian women, Soviet women. So the local government pressed families to enroll their daughters as well as their sons in schools. And veils, which were not legally banned, but they were forbidden in the schools, and girls grew up without them, and mass literacy rate was profound. So the, the Soviet propaganda showed posters with, uh, you know, women occupying desks, being active in the military, uh, women's access to science, like here, women's access, uh, Central Asian women's access to, to politics. To politics, yes. But um, what's interesting is that the Soviet uh, uh, em uh, emancipation politics was uh, pretty much a paradox. Yes. And the paradox was that women and men were supposed to be equal only in participating in wage labor and political activism, which was both necessary for the Soviet social, political, and economic transformation. But in daily life, like I'm showing here, the homosocial gathering of the uh, men in the Soviet Uzbekistan. So in the everyday life, um, gender discourse on strong men and supportive women was still paramount. The Soviet uh, universal education and ideological em emphasis on equality among men and women that could be achieved through their participation in wage, labor, and political activism provided Central Asians with competing models of femininity and masculinities. And some women could occupy positions of power in their respective countries. And even then, women, uh, you know, even then, for women, their families had always come first. So, and this is what Denise Candiore, one of the scholars of Central Asia, called the Soviet paradox. So what does the Soviet paradox mean? By 1980s, with some geographic discrepancies, women in the Soviet Central Asia achieved universal literacy rate and had a complete access to state-sponsored healthcare and childcare. However, Soviet modernization for women was entrenched in social, socialist paternalism wherein the idea of placing women on equal terms with men in all aspects of political, social, and economic life was concurred with promotion of motherhood as their natural and national duty. This made women's participation in the Soviet Union paradoxical. The Socialist Women's Liberation Project emerged between the radical Soviet emancipation policies and oppressive paternalistic regime of the state. So this paternalistic state made costs of social and biological reproduction unbearable for women and ultimately undermined claims to women's equality and sexual egalitarianism. So this paradox was carried out, carried out and into the post-Soviet era and influenced post-socialist gender regimes in its uh, former states and created contradictions for women to claim their citizenship in the new context of the neoliberal market and decentralized democratization. If in the Soviet Union, women made claims to citizenship through the entitlement to state-sponsored welfare and social protection in the new conditions, economic conditions, these have been fully eroded and feasible alternatives have not been in supplied. So new contradictions for women's participation in the post-Soviet nation building emerged in Central Asia, promoting liberal democratic values as central to its development uh, path. The state has also been in in enhancing traditionalization which in practice meant that progressive development principles could not be meaningfully applied to women. So we're now turning to the discussion of gender order in the post-1991, women encountering tradition. And indeed, for many scholars and practitioners, there was a looming question in 1991, 
with the Soviet legacy of high educational levels and workforce participation among women, would the transition to democracy and market economy open doors or erect new barriers for women in post-Soviet society? So these are the kinds of um, elements of the new social order that women encountered in that era. As we said, uh, as I said before, there was a dislocation of social services provision, um, such as healthcare, education, pension system. There was increased participation of women, uh, of women in informal sector of the labor market. We all have known about the shuttle bus uh, economy in which women were central actors. Uh, migratory flows um, and in mass labor migration out of these countries rise of religious consciousness and practices, um, specifically of Islam, women's exclusion from political participation, uh, growth of civil society, influx of international assistance programs to deliver gender equality, and what we've mentioned already, the rise of neo-familial ideology. I will try to briefly discuss some of these parameters for the sake of you know, time. So I'd like to talk about the rise of neo-familial ideology. Um, this particular one is highly related to the processes of new nation building that ensued after independence. So constructing national ideology was of paramount importance after 1991. Um, and it's important to note that Central Asian states initially were unwilling to separate from the Soviet Union. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, it had to develop new national concepts which would prioritize their post-Soviet independence. So the ruling regimes were bound to construct ideologies that were based um, on the previous Soviet geographic uh, division and also promoted, promoted the state's sovereignty. So Central Asian leaders looked to the past experiences as sources for ideological inspiration. In this respect, the role of Soviet Union had to be left out, um, had to be left out, right? And emerging stories were historical narratives about the important past, which was expressed in the political elite's new branding and promoting of certain um, historical elements that would emphasize the antiquity and uniqueness of each new Central Asian ethnicity. So then historical figures, usually male warriors, were chosen as symbols of both the nation's antiquity and aptitude of the statehood in each Central Asian state. So for instance, uh, um, Tajikistan's president Rahmonov's ideology emphasized the Tajik's experience in statehood during the Samanid Empire. And the, the first picture here is uh, Ismail I, the ruler of Samanid uh, groups. Uh, in Kyrgyzstan, uh, President Akayev, to accommodate rising ethno-national feelings, um, shifted uh, his ideology to Manas, uh, which is uh, one of the world's longest oral narrations. And his seven maxims were now you know, mentioned in the epic were now included in the national state ideology. In Uzbekistan, political administration appealed to the national hero, uh, Amir Timur. So all three are represented here uh, in, in this slide. But, you know, gender in Central Asian states today cannot be separated from these changing political regimes, precarious economies, and national striving for cultural authenticity. And religion and culture have informed the transformation of post-Soviet gender order in Central Asia. Uh, and each country has its own case of free tra traditionalizing, which has become a defining feature of post-Soviet nationalism. How gender is implicated uh, there is quite uh, straightforward, but also implicit. So there were new national concepts uh, from you know, the Soviet idea of development to new ideas. Nation states has have always constructed connections between gender and nation. And any nation building process has always referred to men and women with distinct, specific and hierarchical representations. And these processes attribute women and men um, to assigned roles um, in different realms, such as family, work, political leadership, etc. 
and promotion of women's biological role constituted a strategic deployment of notions of cultural authenticity in service of the new ideological goal. And such a return established a strong narrative which reinstates states ethno-national national building and legitimate the power of the um, ruling uh, regime. So here we have, we, we see new national concepts and um, ethno ethnicization of public spaces. So instead of what we see on the left part, which is a colorful Soviet era mosaic promoting the technical education among the Kyrgyz people, we see new national concepts like the, in Kyrgyzstan is the concept of nomadism. It hosted, the country hosted a number of what is called world's um, uh, nomad games. And the, issue, uh, the, the concept of nomadism itself became a central core uh, to the national um, identity. Yeah, to the national identity, yes. So the, um, so here, the, this new national identity, which look back to the uh, newly imagined national, uh, national traditions uh, are quite gendered. Um, and there is this distinctive feature of ideological response uh, to post-socialist nationalism and new understanding of transformation. And this feature is double natured, uh, which is the post-Soviet decolonization needed to have claims to independence. Um, but also the post-socialist identity was built upon the uh, neoliberal reforms led by the state. So the traditional nationalist ideology uh, plus the neoliberalism uh, you know, as a new economic dogma were both antipodes of communism. But when the demands of the global capitalism you know, was undermining the claims of sovereignty, it had to be compensated by strengthening of the cultural inner and essential component of the ethnonational identity. So women always understood as the bearers of ethnic traditions and culture were to remain protected by the influence of Western neoliberalism seen as another threat to national uh, you know, spirit, spiritual content. And one or you know, ways of doing this was through controlling women. And women again were central to motherhood, which is glorified through this uh, emphasis on biological reproduction as reported by the state. Yes, um, yes. for example, father's participation was narrowly defined in terms of economic provision, authority, and decision-making, but, um, uh, but the gender order in contemporary Central Asia, uh, you know, being nation-state centered, which promotes motherhood, which promotes certain ideas of femininity and masculinity, but was also uh, gender dichotomous, which means there are no other place, there are no place for people other than women and men. Same sex practices are still criminalized and medicalized in Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, whereas Kyrgyzstan, for instance, um, has made a number of attempts to adopt uh, what is called a gay propaganda law, which is a replica of Russian uh, legislation, hate law. Um, going, but going back to uh, um, this state-endorsed idea of needing to protect cultural um, capital of each country in which women's role was central, and as such, women had to be, quote unquote, protected, um, but in fact, meaning controlled, yes. And one way of controlling women in the name of tradition is of course, through the dress. So um, uh, here I'm showing um, a photo from a 376 page government issued guidebook on recommended outfits in Tajikistan. In fact, since 2015, the government of, the, of Tajikistan has enacted various pieces of legislation that specifically encourage women to wear Tajik national dress. And, you know, by this development or de-development by itself is interesting because it shows how the women's question refeatured um, 
in the newly independent Central Asian states when the topic of national tradition and economic development acquired specific significance. So the degree and the particular manner of integration of these countries into the global economy were distinctly different for men than for women. Independent of changes taking place in the external world, the new Central Asian nations were not to lose its virtues expressed in their culture, tradition, and spiritual content, which are all associated with women and the, uh, their demeanor. So local women whose areas of responsibility became defined around such virtues became subjected to new controversies. The controversies were related to applications of dichotomous, such as men, women, old, new, development, tradition, and they defined various aspects of women's everyday lives, the dress, the manners, sexual practices, etc. The new Central Asian woman was inherently an improved version of any woman. She was chaste, decent, compliant, faithful, obedient. Um, in a way, she was re-established as a woman through erasing her features that she acquired through a long Soviet era and under the continuous new threat of globalization. And while it is true that many women in Central Asia continue to work outside of their homes, and they remain politically active and they enter civil society movement. But the notion, the nationalist notion um, has its ideological preference centered on women's uh, domesticity. So the new Central Asian femininity is granted a status of cultural superiority and alternative definitions of modern womanhood are less relevant to it and less continuous with the new national ideology because the new place for, home, for women was her home. Transgressing these boundaries were seen as threaten, threatening and aimed at devaluing and displacing the position in which this newly established woman um, was located. Now, importantly, religion or Islam has become an important component of national identity and also a source of discourses on gender and and power. The religious sentiments were used to amplify and legitimate the impenetrable gender dichotomy, associated discourses on duties and rights, which were radically different for males and females, with men having God-given rule to lead and with women having a supportive role. And such differences curtailed women's ability to pursue uh, certain careers and aspirations. I'd like to use two examples from Kyrgyzstan here because they uh, implicate yes, and demonstrate how women's dress, women's bodies become central in the discussion of Kyrgyzstan's, Kyrgyzstan's um, identity, religion, uh, and all of this taking place in the construction of national identity and the place of Kyrgyzstan in the global politics. So I'm showing you a piece from uh, Nasreddin and Yesen Amanova's research. Uh, they um, analyze uh, events from July 2016 16, when the residents of Bishkek, which is the capital city, and many other cities around Kyrgyzstan uh, saw billboards uh, with banners depict depicting these three images next to each other. So the first image uh, portrays a group of Kyrgyz women wearing their traditional dresses. The second one includes a group of women in white Islamic dresses. And the third image is very dark. It depicts women in black Islamic um, dresses with niqabs covering their face. And the signs below ask, uh, my poor people, where are you slacking? And the banners were initiated by the head of an unknown private educational foundation. But later, it was financially supported directly from the administration of the president, Kyrgyz president Atambayev. So the images were, and, uh, were directly criticized. But they themselves criticized the new trends in the way Kyrgyz women dressed. And the first image was to show that Kyrgyz women, if you know, are traditional, are traditional and modern, but not uh, covering their faces um, uh, and implicating that they're not 
overly irreligious, yes. And the banners immediately sparked controversy in the news and social media with people, you know, divided into supporting or opposing the installation. Uh, notably, this was done uh, in preparation for the visit of the German uh, chancellors, Chancellor Angela Merkel. So there, there were responses from the Muslim community, um, such as, you know, that the billboards were dangerous, they divide the society, so then the um, banners were vandalized. They were bored, you know, burned. Then they were removed and replaced with alternative banners, which looked like that. Uh, you know, kind of um, the same logo, which says, my poor people, where are you slacking? And showing women in traditional dress, as opposed to women in miniskirts, you know, westernized images of, of women. And again, as a criticism of overly westernization of the community, uh, Kyrgyz community. Again, through, you know, depicted through the women's body and through the women's dress. The discussion ensued in which, you know, uh, even the president, Kyrgyz president said something like, well, at least girls in miniskirts do not hide bombs under them. So eventually the, the, the posters were um, replaced with the Olympic team coming back from um, the competition um, and, you know, talking to the, the, the entire nation's uh, pride. Another example, which is recent, which is only a few weeks um, ago, um, illustrates, again, you know, gender, women, body, and religion. So just a few weeks ago, two Kyrgyz wrestlers became gold medalists during the World Wrestling Championship when a local religious leader, you know, with a huge, um, followers group criticized them, criticized these women for showing off their bodies. Um, he said, uh, his name is Orzubek Chotonov, and he said, they're almost fully naked. The whole world can see their chicken thighs, their bodies. This is wrong. So again, we can see how in the post-Soviet construction of gender, women's place is no longer in the public, in the public, uh, in the public dom domain, her body, her dress are central to the public discussion of the place of the women in the society. Um, the implications of these two uh, you know, stories are uh, far-fetching, yes. There is different, differently, there are definitely connections between religion, nation, and gender in Central Asia. And then the women's dress is a, is a way of control. Yes, is a way of controlling um, the women themselves in the name of the nation, in the name of the tradition, and in the name of the ethnic cultural values. Um, Islam centers women's own motherhood as the pinnacle of uh, fe uh, female manhood and it's a duty you know it's her duty to the family to the state but also to her religion and such a discourse allows for the greater control of a woman through establishing control over her body yes so uh, even 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 this discourse of threat yes like Muslim women as threat helps um establishing and uh, strengthening this control because it legitimizes the need for the women to be controlled. And it also stigmatizes and others, um, the Muslim women. I'm now going uh, into a short, a very short uh, discussion about the Muslim masculinity in the new Soviet states, because both the Soviet and contemporary Central Asian gender order assume the normative masculinity to reflect a male's duty to provide for the family and protect the, and protect the family. Only in the Soviet Union, financial provision was the duty to the state. Whereas in the current one, it is the duty of the proper Muslim male and his ethno-national traditional responsibility towards his family and the nation. So today, normative masculinity and the state is tasked with physical and also symbolic protection of the family. So this appeal to religious sensibility increased importance of honor, shame, purity, and chastity. And this morally charged domain um, 
in gender, uh, you know, in dom dominant gender model instigate various forms of punishment in relation to those who transgress it. Now, in addition to, you know, these forms of punishment, there is this uh, marker uh, that challenges this particular post-Soviet masculinity model because the, the, the conditions in which this masculinity is expected is, you know, inclusive of precarious financial and political instability and, uh, you know, unstable global market economy. So it's difficult to fulfill this ideal. And economic reforms left many men jobless and necessitated women's more active participation in the informal and formal labor market. And in these new realities of precarious economy, expectations uh, of masculinities became a cultural paradox and many men feel inadequate. So this feeling of inadequacy might be related to various forms of violence against women as an outlet for expressing their masculinity, but also instigated by the state-sponsored appeals to ethno-national tradition and religion, which implicitly encourage such brutal acts again, uh, because they receive legitimacy through their connection to um, going back to the historic ethno-national past and uh, becoming authentic uh, national people. I'm going to bring in a couple of sad examples. So again, from Kyrgyzstan, uh, we have groups called Black Patriots or nationalist device squads, um, which are um, male, uh, groups of males of Kyrgyz ethnic uh, groups, yes, um, um, who've become active in enforcing particular forms of gendered nationalism. Um, and also they occupy central place in the public discourse um, about gender, women, nationalism, and women's behavior. So one particular case was uh, um, a series of incidents, actually, in which female Kyrgyz migrants in Russia were subjected to horrific abuse and violence by the groups of Black patri Patriots. But they call themselves black patriots and they were, they tasked themselves with disciplining and punishing Kyrgyz women for association uh, with non-Kyrgyz men. Uh, so what they did, they would uh, find uh, ethnic Kyrgyz female migrants in Russia and punish them, yes, and they would uh, telephone, they would um, record with their telephones uh, how they tortured uh, this um, this women they put these women what they called on trial for what they you know for what this black black patriot perceived as inappropriate and unpatriotic behavior. So women in the videos appear extremely frightened and they're stripped naked and they're forced to say their names, place of origin, and address. Sometimes they would be showing their passports in clothes. The victims would be tortured, beaten up, threatened ele with electrocution and knife, and they were subjected to extreme humiliation. And in some cases, the victims of these crimes reported uh, rape. And in one case, a woman was even beaten to death. And although the video, so the, the videos were um, broadcasted, yes, circulated via mobile phones within the network of migrant workers in, in Moscow with an idea that it would um, minimize the chances that other Kyrgyz women would follow that. And the videos sparked controversies in Russia and in Kyrgyzstan, but many did sympathize with the Patriots' motives, uh, which were seen as uh, the need to punish inappropriate or loose behavior of women and protect their honor. Um, and uh, the, uh, the acts were seen as uh, patriotic, truly masculine and ethnic, and ethnic. So uh, this was just one example. The another example is, you know, the um, widespread uh, illegal practice of bride kidnapping and child marriages all in Kyrgyzstan and also in some parts of Kazakhstan, yes. Um, there is a myth that created that there is a tradition of bright kidnapping, um, which uh, makes it easy for 
um, young men and their families to abduct young women and forcefully and forcefully um, uh, marry them. In fact, it is reported that 25% of girls between 24 and 50 years of age were married through bride kidnapping. Uh, it's what is important for, for, for us to know is that in, it is that nationalist projects in KG, like in other post-Soviet countries, which foster creating myths and traditions through which gender is reconstructed and patriarchal values and national ideas undergo a reconfiguration. And the repercussions like here are not only gendered, but serious. So bride kidnapping is only one example. And here on the slide, I'm showing a photo from a protest against such a practice in Kyrgyzstan. And the protester holds two images of two women who were brutally killed in an act of, of bride kidnapping when they forcefully opposed being kidnapped and, and, and uh, you know, married uh, to this, this person, yes. So violence against women then is endorsed by the society, is approved by the families and confirmed, you know, by the police as a logical outcome. Uh, of the new uh, nationalist discourse. And I'm saying police because in neither of these cases, police acted and treated these cases as a crime. They treated this case, they treated, you know, in the last, in the scenario with Aizada, a police person um, told the mother of the, of the girl when she reported, you know, her missing and kidnapped, he told her to be happy and be prepared for a wedding. So again, it's indeed, incidence of violence against um, women in Central Asia is quite high. Uh, we, know, we know that uh, nearly 30% of women in the Kyrgyz Republic, 20% uh, in Kazakhstan, 20 in Tajikistan, do experience gender violence by their intimate partners uh, or non-partners uh, at least once in their lifetime. And the actual figures are likely to be higher because the data is usually you know, scarce and or outdated and incidents are typically underreported. Other forms of gender-based violence against women in the region include uh, domestic patriarchal abuse, meaning uh, when newly married young women come into their husband's families, they uh, often um, experience violence, psychological, financial, economic, and physical from the family of their, of their husbands. Polygyny is another form. Kalim, which is the bride price, virginity testing, bride abduction, forced marriages, and um, honor killing. So there is a strong argument that these forms of violence are an expected outcome of the intricate uh, linkages between how post-Soviet politics of gender and nation and violence are interconnected. So there is a belief, there is a belief that there is a post-Soviet national identity related processes called traditional, traditionalizing nationalism in which the division between feminine and masculine is fixed and gender binary is um, uh, endorsed by the state and in which state controls women's bodies through construction of maternity as a national duty. And then the national ideology restricts women's political participation in the name of tradition, authenticity, and nature. And all of these processes accentuate women's um, subordination. So one example again comes from Kyrgyzstan uh, and it's the uh, uh, ban, uh, a law uh, on prohibition of women from more than 400 professions. Uh, and I am just um, quoting here some excerpts from the text of the law. So justification for women to be barred from pursuing careers in 446 professions is um, embedded in conversations such as morally inappropriate, it's dangerous, it's unhealthy for reproductive roles. So it's morally inappropriate because this work may imp implicate working um, at night or working in male uh, uh, for working in, in male uh, collectives. It's dangerous for reproductive health, which again uh, contradicts the uh, state endorsed policy on, on maternity. Yes. Um, speaking again of these politics, gender violence, and nation, um, this is a picture from just, uh, you know. 
a, a year ago, yes, uh, when uh, a year and a half ago, when a, a women's peaceful march on the women's uh, international day was brutally suppressed by, you know, by both the police and the black patriots. Another picture is from Kazakhstan when uh, uh, a Women's Day, act, uh, you know, activities on the same day were uh, um, suppressed. Um, in fact, activists were um, burning a, a funeral wreath in a public place as a symbol for uh, a, a rally against uh, violence against against women, and they were convicted for violating the law and or on organizing and holding peaceful demonstrations and uh, um, organizers were penalized and you know uh, with administrative um, you know, fines. Um, again, transgressing the norms, yes, trans transgressing these ideas about new femininities are punishable. And you know I hope I've illustrated that the punishments are quite serious. Um, in my next uh, slide, I will talk a little bit about another uh, development that happened after the post-1991 uh, um, collapse of the Soviet Union, which is the encounter with the international development community, which came to Central Asia in large you know, quantities with an idea to bring gender equality. So these organizations uh, had a specific stance towards the Central Asian women, and they depicted them as hard hit by transition, suffering low status, being uh, economically insecure, uh, feel ex excluded from political and economic arenas, poorly paid in the um, precarious uh, labor market and overwhelmed with, with daily struggles. At the same time, the same sources illustrated uh, Central Asian women as a resource for promoting development and democratization, being agents um, alongside the government and uh, economic sectors. Um, uh, however, um, these encounters um, um, <laughs> inadvertently led to uh, lush yes, development of various uh, projects and programs um, for, for women um, in international organizations working in, in Kyrgyzstan uh, introduced other <laughs> new challenges, yes, and new obstacles. Let me talk about them. So they included the following ones, yes. So yes, the, the term gender now appeared in Central Asian uh, landscape, yes. And the uh, <clears throat> various paradigms related to gender were introduced to, to the public. However, the uh, new hierarchies and contradict contradicting, contradicting um, agendas were introduced as well, even though the support for development uh, of uh, local women's NGOs was there. Um, the hierarchies and the, the, the new challenges were not erased. However, uh, new ways of resistance also were, were um, found by the local uh, women's groups to resist the new kinds of oppressions from the uh, international organizations. So the internationalization of gender norms in Central Asia included the following. Uh, well, gender became an important political policy concept for international organizations. State programs in most of the Central Asian states were introduced and international agreements on women's rights were re ratified in most of the countries of the current Central Asia, which also included legislative changes to uh, enhance gender equality. Uh, money or new money was now available to fund development of new local civil society, which was then believed to be a good uh, alternative to um, the government, who was unable to uh, fulfill its promise to bring gender equality. And tremendous numbers of women's NGOs were, were established. Um, they quickly developed a general, you know, they quickly developed uh, new areas of expertise, 
um, and quickly learned how to meet the expectations of the international donors for finding. However, however, contradicting agendas and new hierarchies were also inbuilt. So there was the official gap between the aim of the projects and the implementations. The universal norms and local specificities were often contradictory. A new divide was introduced. Yes, between the West and the East, between the developed and the underdeveloped, with between traditions and modernity. So in other words, new hierarchies were created, yes, among women um, who were seen, you know, as westernized versus non-westernized, English speaking versus non-English speaking, knowing how to speak English versus not knowing how to speak English, rural and urban, urban agricultural versus um, non-agricultural, etc. So, uh, and in a, in a way, there was a reinforcement of the elite hegemony and patriarchal leadership, in which um, local leaders, local female leaders, would adopt specific patriarchal and um, autocratic yes ways of communicating. And the you know the argument here is that largely former patterns of domination between you know, um, East and West, male and female were reinforced, were reinforced. But in my last part of the research, I want to focus on the kinds of locally defined ways of resisting these uh, new hierarchies and oppressions. So uh, uh, John Hawar talks about using transformative approach, double bookkeeping, reflections on bifurcated consciousness and learning to change donors agenda on the women uh, working in the local NGOs. <clears throat> Nasridinov and Yesena Manova talk about how um, women's religious groups um, uh, express their own uh, um, ways of, uh, you know, fight, ways of fighting and struggling. So, in which they frame hijab, for instance, as their own choice and a result of their own struggle, uh, they uh, sh showcase female female Islamic activism and proactive position of the Kyrgyz Muslim women. They talk about OTNs, which are female Islamic teachers as guardians of faith in the Soviet and, and post-Soviet uh, times. Research in Tajikistan showed how hijab is a cultural strategy for women to help access the economic sector dominated by men. It's a very interesting study showing how when women put on a hijab, they can actually go to public spaces without being you know, afraid of being harassed. Through popular culture, local activists produced alternative discourses which transgress prevailing models of gender behaviors, which they find oppressive and local artists use their platforms to challenge existing national ideologies by exposing gender struggles. So this is a Kyrgyz singer Zere with her uh, uh, you know, artistic uh, activism. We have uh, Daniela Sudikova in the Tajikistan, uh, sorry, in Kazakhstan, which is a singer and also a songwriter and how she used Instagram to share her story of sexual harassment. We have Alia Shalkar who is, um, also an artist from Kazakhstan, and she created an alternative re reality video campaign IL, to discuss domestic violence, bright kidnapping, sexual harassment, victim blaming, and discrimination against women in the workplace and politics and in Kazakh society in general. So she includes six short video creating, you know, and she created them during the quarantine. We have art exhibitions like this one in, in Bishkek called Dreams of the Invisible Women, uh, focusing on women suffering from violence and discrimination, women living with HIV or women using drugs, as well as the LBT women using to send message to the society that they are there, they also love and are loved, and they deserve to be happy and have equal rights. Another one is, of course, is the feminist exhibition of art, Feminale in Bishkek. And here they're showing, um, it's a kind of an installation of the oppression uh, suffered by young uh, women uh, wives who live in the uh, petri local households. And the amount of work, household work they need to do. And she is, this is, um, you know, this particular one shows how they must clean the intestines of uh, animals for national cuisine and how labor intensive this, this labor intensive this work is and how hierarchical this work is. Um, you are assigned this kind of you know this kind of job 
uh, as the person with the lower social status in the family and kin. We have Omida Ahmedova from Uzbekistan and her um, uh, artistry as yes, her media projects on the burden of virginity. And, uh, you know, where she raises a question about virginity testing in Uzbekistan. She, in fact, is uh, persecuted by the government and she's still burned, uh, sorry, she's still banned from uh, leaving the country. And, um, you know, because she's under the investigation. Um, we have um, from Kazakhstan an artist, Almagul Menlinbaeva. She uses these installations to draw attention to the problem. And here, this is her installation against child marriage. This one is her installation of, of you know, where she merges the problem of uh, desertification and the desiccation of the RLC. Uh, in, you know, she, um, she, <laughs> sort of conflates the violence against women with violence against nature, all man-made. So these are the only political organization of the struggle, which may be individual and it may seem unorganized, but these are you know, the prominent women who lead by examples, like through, including through sports. And I've showed you already, uh, you know, uh, gold medal world wrestling champions from, from Kyrgyzstan. Um, or another one from Kyrgyzstan that shows, you know, what's possible for, you know, for for, for women. We have uh, we have uh, uh, girls groups working um, together on science projects. Here, this is a project in which, you know, the first first the first Kyrgyz satellite was actually uh, built uh, by a group of, uh, you know, women in STEM. Political participation we have. Uh, you know, despite so much violence against women and against their participation in this government, in this local um, <clears throat> uh, election to the local government, many women, you know, legally won this, this battle. And everyday practices that women engage in are, <laughs> uh, you know, are legitimately framed as a resistance because their resistance and active agency is meaningfully contained within their everyday practices that, you know, that men and women undertake within the constraint of the existing gender order. And there is an emergent, emerging cohort of, you know, as I said, digital feminists and feminist bloggers and feminist academics and feminist entrepreneurs. And all this points to the complexity of the subject that I have chosen to talk to you today. So gender perception, in Central Asia and its repercussions. And every word in this topic is complex, it's contested, it's politicized, and it needs to be unfolded. And there is no simple answer to questions about gender in the region. There is no single universal framework to capture the dynamic and nuanced processes involved in the political, economic, cultural, and social development of gender. And my hope is that with what I've discussed today, very shortly, very briefly, I was able to spark at least some thinking about these non-trivial topics. And then I hope I, have, I was able to provoke some fruitful thinking and debates about the intersections and the multiple linkages um, as the context within which topic of gender needs to be considered in any meaningful you know, discussion. So I've, um, I'd like to thank the organizers for letting me speak about um, and gender in Central Asia, which is so dear to my heart. And like, I'd like to encourage you to contact me at this email address if you'd like to continue our conversation or have any questions. And I would like to finish uh, this long lecture and um, hope to stay in touch with you. And thank, and thank you, of course, for your interest um, in this topic. <laughs>